then. Um, and, and like last time, um, if you guys are unable to, to hear me or it kind of skips or, or whatever, just let me know. Um, I can turn off my camera. We'll kind of troubleshoot together if we have issues. Um, but um, my name is Emma. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student, um, just about to finish up. Um, and today um, we're going to talk about perineoplastic syndromes. And you may be wondering what is what is a perineoplastic syndrome even in the first place? And, and we're definitely going to talk about that before we get started. So no fear. Um, some of you might have even Googled what a perineoplastic syndrome is. Um, and that's perfect. You're, you're ahead of the, the curve. Um, but we're going to keep it very simple um, as to not stress you guys out at your level. Um, trust me, you're not supposed to know much at your level. It's okay. Um, you, you probably have, you know, a basic science background and, and that's all right. Um, so we're, we're going to really break it down and, and keep it at a simple level so you guys can learn something. So this isn't, you know, str stressing you out. Um, but let's get started. Um, so I do have a pre-poll for you guys, um, and I'm going to launch this so you can um, answer as, as per usual. Um, go ahead and, and answer um, about how much you know about perineoplastic syndromes. I think most of you guys are in there. So let me share the results with you. It looks like most of you kind of said you know nothing. One person knows some, which is cool. Um, so they'll be able to, to answer some of the questions. Um, otherwise, we're going to keep it fairly simple. This is kind of an internal medicine lecture, but you know, really, you know, also uh, kind of hematology oncology, really, because all these perineoplastic syndromes usually go along with malignancies. So, all right, let me stop sharing that. Um, and we'll keep going here. All right, so this is kind of our, our outline here. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, an introduction here to perineoplastic syndromes. Um, I'm gonna give you one case today, we're gonna do one. Um, and then I'm gonna kind of give you an, an overview of perineoplastic syndrome specifically with lung cancer. And then we're gonna kind of uh, sum it up at the end. Um, so it should be fairly simple. Um, perineoplastic, perineoplastic syndromes can be complex, but um, I'm going to show and, and kind of point out a few that you may be familiar with, um, and, and we'll kind of keep it at that level for today. Um, and, and what is your guys' role? Um, I'm going to ask somebody to read the case um, to, to save my voice, um, and then uh, I'm, I'm also going to ask that you guys kind of participate as much as you know, you're comfortable with. Um, ask questions, you know, be involved. I think that's the way you kind of have accountability and really kind of uh, learn when you when you participate. Um, other than that, um, I, I want you guys to fill out this little soap note um, throughout the presentation. The case today will be more com comprehensive than my usual cases, my little mini cases. So you guys will be able to really um, kind of fill in the, uh, the actual soap note in its entirety. And in case you missed my first message, there's the, uh, the link to all the resources you'll need. Um, it has the soap note and we'll, we'll talk about if this is your first time with us, we'll talk about what the soap note actually is as well um, here in the next slide. And um, as promised, here it is. Um, soap note is, or soap itself is kind of an acronym, um, S-O-A, and P. Okay. So it's an, it's an acronym for the way we kind of write our notes to, to kind of inform, you know, everybody else, the, what's going on basically. So the, um, the subjective portion is basically what the patient tells us. So um, kind of the history of present illness, that's what HPI is, and then review of systems. So for instance, if somebody comes in with abdominal pain, we might kind of um, include pertinent positives and negatives that have to do with that belly pain. So things like um, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, um, if they have blood in their stool, um, if, you know, certain things like that, which kind of tell us, um, pointing us in the direction of our differential diagnosis, okay? Then the other thing that we want to include is the subjective portion, which is the vital signs and, and physical exam. So those are things that we kind of produce, things that we find. Then finally, um, the assessment and plan, that's what A and P stand for in SOAP. 
Um, that is going to be, um, the assessment's gonna be the, the things that we think are going on. So if somebody had abdominal pain and, and we thought um, it was an appendicitis, we would put appendicitis. Um, and then we would put um, what we would do about that appendicitis. So consult um, surgery for um, appendectomy. Um, then we would say uh, keep patient NPO. Um, things like this, you know, start uh, antibiotics, um, tifoxidin or whatever you would use, you know, so that's what we're doing. We're putting the diagnosis and then listing what we would do as a result of that. Okay. Let me clear all that and let's keep going here. So in terms of perineoplastic syndromes, um, and, and that's probably the, the biggest thing here is knowing what a perineoplastic syndrome is. And I, I kept this little snippet because, you know, I couldn't find a better way to say it other than to just take a, a screenshot of, of uh, I think this is Medscape, their definition of this. But essentially, a, a perineoplastic syndrome is a sort of um, disorder that occurs as a result of a neoplasm or a malignancy. Okay. So what it, what's happening is the, the symptoms that are produced by this perineoplastic syndrome, um, can be sort of multifactorial or they can be in multiple systems. So we see things like endocrine effects, which we're going to see today. Um, neuromuscular, musculoskeletal things. We can see cardiovascular, hematologic, um, one that's common that we see that in hematologic is um, increased red blood cells. That's often in renal cancer. Okay. Um, so we could see lots of different things um, that are produced because of cancers. Okay. So that's what we're talking about here. So if we see, you know, um, uh, hypercalcemia, for instance, that's a common thing that's produced as a result of a cancer. So we're going to want to think of those things. Um, and, and often the way that we catch malignancies is because of the symptoms that they produced. Um, you know, they're, as you guys probably know, they're not always caught on screening exams or, um, you know, uh, in, in, you know, just straight up, but because of the symptoms that they produce and not usually not painful. Cancer is usually not painful. Um, so usually they cause other symptoms throughout the body, systemic symptoms that in, in turn cause us to say, you know, hey, look, something else might be going on. Okay. So by definition, that's what a perineoplastic syndrome is. I told you we're going to keep it simple. Um, we'll, we'll see if that holds true, if, if it keeps being simple. All right. So I know this is overwhelming. It's a couple of charts and it's listing a lot of things. Okay. But we're going to break it down here. Um, and, and talk about, you know, what these different perineoplastic syndromes are. So here's kind of, we'll start with this one over here, um, this kind of red one. Um, so you can kind of see a few things kind of going on here. We'll start at the top, obviously, with Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome is the result of increased ACTH, which is cortisol, so stress hormone. And as a result, um, patients with Cushing syndrome often get kind of, um, they, they get central obesity, they get kind of the buffalo hump, they get um, hyperglycemia. So they get all of these effects because of the increased cortisol. So we'll keep it simple at that. And we'll say it often is the result of more commonly small cell carcinoma, but can be the result of things like pancreatic cancer and neural tumors, okay? But when we see it, often it's, it's kind of this, but um, it, it can be associated with other cancers. Okay. The other one is um, SIADH and that's syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Okay. That's S-I-A-D-H. Okay. So you'll often see it, or you maybe, maybe even have heard of it at this point. Um, and this one um, is because of um, small cell carcinoma again. So you may be seeing a pattern here so far, um, but also because of intracranial neoplasms. And, and we talked about one where um, for pituitary adenomas, if you were with, with us for that lecture, um, because of the crowding out of the, um, of the pituitary gland and where ADH is secreted, we can see SIADH. Um, and what we see because that is the patient retaining water. We remember that ADH uh, is anti-diuretic hormone. So instead of diuresing, instead of peeing out free water, it's all held back in the body as free water, okay? So other things that we see are um, hypercalcemia, 
Um, and we see it because of para, uh, parathyroid related peptide, which is because of squamous cell carcinoma, but we can also see it because of other cancers. And one that's not included on here is um, because of multiple myeloma. Um, and that's because in multiple myeloma, we often see lesions in the bone. So we can see hypercalcemia as a result of that. Um, other things um, that are, are maybe less uh, prominent, um, polycythemia, we talked about that a little bit where we can see um, we can see an increase in uh, red blood cells as a result of the cancer. We could also see things like carcinoid syndrome and um, hypoglycemia. So we could see insulin or insulin-like hormone as a result. Okay, and then over here on the, uh, let me clear all this. Um, and over here on the right, there's a similar one, but this is kind of, um, you know, broken down by lung cancer specifically. And I want to draw your attention to a few here, um, just to, to kind of, you know, obviously point them out um, because they're, they're high yield, they're important. One that we kind of see as we, oops, as we kind of talked about um, last time is that, um, that perineoplastic syndrome, um, one associated with hypercalcemia. And we can see that with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung because of that PTH related peptide. And if you remember the, the kind of pathway, maybe from chemistry or biology, if you've gotten that so far, we remember that there's parathyroid hormone, which causes the reabsorption of calcium from the bone. Okay. Other ones that are important, um, SIADH and, and um, Cushing syndrome, we see that with small cell carcinoma, okay? And then you're, you keep seeing that, that's what S, uh, SCLC is, it's small cell um, lung cancer. Um, and then the other one that I wanna draw your attention to is Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end, um, but that's also because of small cell carcinoma. And that's one where we get um, weakness due to antibodies um, kind of attacking the presynaptic calcium channel. So we're not getting that release of um, calcium in the, the nerve synapse. So we get weakness as a result. Um, okay. Um, other thing that we can see, um, we can see, and this is kind of with any cancer, really, we can see uh, anemia, leukocytosis, um, and thrombocytosis. Um, similarly with cancers, you can also see kind of the, the opposite of leukocytosis, which is, um, leukopenia. We can also see thrombocytopenia. Okay. So, uh, don't get too caught up with those. It can kind of go either way. All right. And that's really all I want to talk about on that chart. There's a lot there and that's kind of focusing primarily on lung cancers, but know that any of these kind of symptoms, these symptom complexes, can come as the result of um, really any cancer. Um, it doesn't have to just be lung cancer, okay? All right, so we're off to um, a decent start here. Um, let's have somebody read the case if you don't mind. I can read it. Um, so a 55 year old male with a PMH significant for hypertension and HDL presents via EMS for altered mental status and lethargy. His wife is present for the history of whom notes that the patient recently had a CT chest for a chronic cough, which is being further worked up and investigated. He currently smokes and has smoked approximately 1.5 packs per day for 19 years. Perfect, thank you very much for reading that. Um, all right, so my first question is, um, how many pack years um, would this be? Um, we talked about this a little bit in terms of um, pack years, how we calculate that. But what do you guys think? How many pack years is that? Almost 30, yeah, if you're, if you're estimating for sure. Good, yeah, exactly, Emily, you're right. So what we're doing, and it's a simple calculation, um, you're just taking the number of packs per day, that's what PPD stands for, and you're multiplying that by how long that they've smoked. So basically all that is, is 1.5 times 19, which is 28.5, that's right. Good, so um, a few things about this history. Um, you guys tell me, what's important about this history? What kind of caught your attention um, about this patient's presentation? Good. I agree. A, a chronic cough that tells us something's going on and it's been going on for a little while. Anybody else? 
smoking history, altered mental status. I agree. I think uh, altered mental status is always important when somebody presents. And it's important to discern what kind of altered mental status we're talking about here. Good. Lethargy. I agree. I think that's important. What else? Anything else you guys think is important? Yeah, hyperlipidemia, I think that that's always important. And, and kind of in um, combination with hypertension kind of points us in the direction of, um, you know, does this person have risk factors for atherosclerosis, um, plaque in their arteries, or even for um, cardiovascular disease? We wanna think about those things when we talk about those two risk factors. Somebody said a recent CT, I agree. Excellent. Unresponsive to commands. I think that that's important as well. Um, and that kind of leads us right into, you know, our, um, our physical exam, which is over here on the, the right. Um, but if we kind of look at the vitals, that's, you know, what I always look at before I go in and see somebody. Um, I want to see, you know, what's going on. Is this person hypertensive? Are they hypotensive? Are they febrile? Are they tachycardic? All of those things. It gives you kind of uh, more pieces of the puzzle to kind of come to a, a, a diagnosis and correspondingly, um, you know, treat the patient. Good. So we got a normal temperature. Um, Adam is correct. The blood pressure looks low to me as well. Um, and then um, the the heart rate is a little bit high. Um, the in, in terms of general exam, it's kind of just what the patient kind of looks like when you you're looking at them. It can really tell you a lot in your physical exam. But um, the patient is lethargic. Their pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. Why is that important? You guys tell me. What does that kind of maybe rule in or rule out? Yeah, it tells us about stroke and neurological things because we know that cranial nerve two um, is kind of involved in the reflex for, for pupils constricting. So it might tell us about something about the brain, that part of the brain stem being intact. So good. Um, other than that, the patient's tachycardic. Um, they have decreased air movement in um, chain stokes uh, respirations. We're gonna talk about that in the next slide. So don't, don't panic if you don't know what that means. Um, other than that, the patient is unresponsive to commands, which is not a good sign. And also hypo um, reflexic. Um, which is um, also a little bit concerning as well. So let's go to the next slide and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what exactly this chain stokes respirations are. So I have a little bit of a clip here for you to watch. And, and this little um, graphic down here um, to the right kind of helps us um, you know, see that in a graph form, okay? So let me um, start this and then we'll talk about it. And you guys shouldn't be able to hear anything, so, so don't panic. So basically, just watch his, his belly because you can kind of see the movement um, and how he's breathing. So what you're going to kind of see is him starting to breathe a little bit faster. So you'll see deep, fast respirations followed by then they'll kind of slow down and get less frequent. And then you'll see that period of apnea, meaning he's not breathing right here. And then here in a second, you'll see him start to do slower breaths again. And this is exactly what the chain stokes respirations are. So the little um, graph down at the bottom kind of shows that depth of breathing. And they, they do in fact have these kind of apneic periods, but you see him kind of having, a, a, you know, deeper breaths as he kind of goes along here. So you see him deeper and deeper. And this is what chain stokes respirations are. So the increasing depth of, of respiration followed apnea, then it kind of starts all over. So this is like a perfect representation of what chain stokes respirations are. All right. So my question for you guys now is what tests do you want to order? Um, or obviously imaging tests, we can order lab tests, but what do you guys think? What do you guys wanna get right now in order to discern what's going on with this guy? Yeah, chest CT for lung, sure, we can do an X-ray. Absolutely. <clears throat> Anybody else? I 
if somebody has altered mental status and, you know, maybe we haven't, yeah, exactly. Josh, Josh nailed it. I was going to say, we haven't ruled out necessarily a hemorrhagic or um, ischemic stroke, especially if somebody has risk factors for an ischemic stroke, meaning that they may have had plaque in their um, arteries, which lead to ischemia in the brain, meaning no blood flow to the brain, then that would mean, you know, we should probably get a head CT to rule that out. Um, good. Um, and then, um, pulmonary function tests might be what you're thinking about, Adam, in terms of, um, you know, if they are in fact short of breath, we're going to talk about that next week as well. Um, pulmonary function tests, when we talk about dyspnea, um, in terms of, it's just a acute way of saying shortness of breath. Um, but good. I think you guys are on the right track here. Um, and then in terms of strokes, while we're talking about strokes, um, the, the two flavors of, of strokes, I'm going to write this down for you so you have it. So when we talk about strokes, another way we, we say that is um, cerebral vascular accident. Um, and the two flavors of them are ischemic stroke and embolic stroke. Um, and, and when we talk about ischemic, that usually is due to um, atherosclerosis, so forming plaques. Um, and, and we know that plaques are formed, yes, due to familial, but usually due to hyperlipidemia, having increased cholesterol and risk factors for that. Embolic, um, do you guys know why someone might throw a clot to their brain? There's a few risk factors. So there's not one specific answer for this, but think about the heart. Yeah, trauma for sure. You're right. So if we had a, a trauma, that would be a fat embolism where um, you um, can get it from the bone. An aneurysm, yes, um, because it causes turb turbulent flow, though less commonly. Um, clot, yes, a clot, but how do we form that clot based on something going wrong with the heart? We're gonna talk about this in two weeks. So I'm setting you guys up to think about these things before we talk about them. And you, yes, you guys are stuck with me for the next three weeks. DVT, absolutely, that's the number one cause of pulmonary emboli. Um, yes, and DVT that travels, it's maybe, less likely. Blood isn't getting to the brain, yes, that's ischemia. But I'm talking about atrial fibrillation. Um, so, Fibril fibrillation meaning kind of the heart is quivering and because of the left atrial appendage, kind of that little, um, <clears throat> that little sac in the, um, the atria, um, the, the left atrium, um, and because the heart is not kind of pumping in a synchronous mechanism, we have pooling of the blood, okay? And <clears throat> the analogy I like to give is, you know, imagine a pond and imagine a water if you have kind of a waterfall or a fast river kind of traveling, there's less gunk that kind of gets stuck in that river or in that waterfall, okay? Now, if we compare that to a pond, we know that there's a lot of stagnation there. There's a lot of kind of gunk getting trapped at the bottom of the pond. That is exactly kind of a, a parallel to what's going on in the heart. If blood is allowed to pool, all those clotting factors, that fibrinogen, um, the fibrin um, gets kind of um, a, a basically a perfect storm to form a clot, okay? And that's how those clots get um, kind of dislodged and embolized to the heart, okay? So um, now back on topic, um, that's just kind of a setup for what we're going to talk about here in a couple of weeks. But Otherwise, oh, we don't want to see this again. I agree with you guys. Let's keep talking about this. Here's some uh, studies. Um, here's some serum studies. Um, and, and this is a CMP. And you'll see the, the kind of CMP down here. Um, and, and we see right now we have hyponatremia. Hyponatremia meaning low sodium. Um, and if you, if you look at it, it's not that hard. You don't have to remember the word because all it is is hypo natremia. So I'm kind of teaching you words here as well. And what that means, hyponatremia, remember from the periodic table, if you've taken sodium or if you've taken chemistry so far, um, that's what uh, sodium is. It's just Na plus. Okay. So that's what this is. It's hyponatremia. And if we had uh, a lot of sodium in the blood, we would call that hypernatremia. Remember the Na is for um, sodium. 
Okay. And then um, similarly, we do have hypokalemia here, meaning low potassium. Um, and like, like um, hyponatremia, we have um, hypo Kalemia. Remember the periodic table is um, potassium is K and the other part is hyperkalemia. All right. So um, that's fairly simple, um, but we see a, um, a low CO2. Um, and why might we have a low CO2? What do you guys think? Based on how that gentleman, yeah, the rapid breathing, exactly. You guys got it, perfect. Um, and then otherwise, the the BUN and the creatinine are okay. Um, but a couple of things that we see here, so we see a low sodium, okay? So we want to think about, is the low sodium, is that a, a, a problem with salt or is that a problem with water? And you guys should all be able to answer this if you've taken, if you haven't taken chemistry, I'll give you a pass. Um, but this is always that thing that they teach you in, in chemistry. I think I can remember my professor teaching this a thousand years ago. Um, but what I'm telling you um, is imagine if we have um, a little membrane here, okay? Um, Wait, let me make you guys answer this first before I keep talking. Um, is, is the hyponatremia a problem with sodium or is it a problem with water? Yeah, good. It's a problem with water. It's always a problem with water. Um, you know, it's it, unless that, you know, they're just completely binge eating salt, which is less, less common, less likely. Um, or not, you know, even if they're not eating salt, but that's not, not going to cause this hyponatremia. Okay. So what I'm going to show you here is here's kind of a, the membrane here. And if we have all of these salt molecules over here, which way is the, the, um, the free water going to go through the semi-permeable membrane? So say these are are uh, aquaporins, which allow water to go through. Which way is the water gonna go? Is it gonna go from um, left to right or right to left? So we'll say on this side, there's this many um, sodium molecules. Good, you guys are right. So the water is gonna go from left to right because we know that the free water will balance out. And then this is essentially the process of osmosis, okay? So you guys um, got that, you, you paid attention to your chemistry class or you're studying for the MCAT or whatever. Um, but these things do come back in medicine as well. And that's what I'm trying to tell you here is that this is not a problem with sodium itself. Yes, we use sodium as a marker, but we use sodium as a marker of free water, okay? We're look, this is a water problem in the body. Okay, so we're looking at the urine osmolality, okay? Um, and you guys know the calculation for osmolality. We're looking at the, the actual osmols in, in free water and we're looking at the urine and this is low. Um, we know that if it's less than 150, that's a low number, okay? Similarly, the serum osmolality also low, which tells us that we have um, more free water than, um, than we would love. Um, and, and we know that that's true because this patient is lethargic um, and not able to respond to commands and um, hyporeflexic. Um, okay, so um, somebody wanted a CT scan. So here you go, here's your CT scan. Um, and does anyone see a problem? And um, if you wanna pull out your, your pointer and, um, and point it out while I start to go over this, we certainly can. Um, so remember CT scans, what we're doing is we're looking up through the feet, okay? So what, what we see here is this is the right and this is the left, all right? This is posterior and we know that because we can see the, um, the vertebrae right here. We can see part of the ribs kind of here, here, we can see part here. And this is just a cross section. We're taking a cross section um, through, um, the, through the chest and we see kind of lungs here and we see lungs here. And so remember on a CT scan, bone's gonna be white, um, air is gonna be black, and then 
um, tissue is going to be kind of in the middle because it has free water in it. So that's kind of gray. And then this is anterior. Okay. So we see, you know, um, obviously the trachea here, we see the air, we can see part of the esophagus posterior. Um, we can see part of the, the aorta coming in here and we can see some plaques in the aorta. Um, but there's something here that doesn't belong. Does anybody know? Do you guys have your pointers out and can show us? Left lung, I agree. This guy, not normal, okay. Um, so in the lung, you know, sometimes we'll see kind of these, I should have showed you a normal um, to compare with. So sometimes we'll see kind of, uh, you know, the, the bronchial tree and things like that. But in this, we see a lung mass. Um, and, and this is kind of, uh, if we were to say, obviously we, we describe things by being central um, or peripheral, would you guys call this central or peripheral wherever this, this lung um, this lung masses. Yeah, it's central, good, excellent. Um, so, you know, and, and that's important to discern because different lung cancers um, often present different ways. So ones like, um, ones like, so we'll say central, um, and often there's kind of this mnemonic that central ones are associated with cigarettes, cigarette smoking. Um, and those are the ones that start with an S, which is nice. Um, so that's squamous cell carcinoma, small cell carcinoma. And then the ones that are peripheral um, are usually adenocarcinoma, so kind of glandular. And those are usually the people of whom are, have never been smokers. So you may have met one or two of those people so far in, in your life where they've never smoked cigarettes, but they've gotten this lung cancer. Um, those are usually adeno, adenocarcinomas, okay? And now um, we're, we say, okay, this is a central, maybe it's a squamous cell carcinoma, maybe it's a small cell carcinoma. How do we discern what this is? You guys tell me, what, what are we gonna order next? Good, a biopsy. I agree with Seema and Josh. Um, perfect. So we might call our, our friendly neighborhood um, interventional radiologist or, you know, um, maybe cardiothoracic surgery. We could order MRI, but it won't tell us much about the pathology of the actual specimen of the mass. Okay. So um, here is um, the biopsy, which I know you guys are looking at it in your cross-eyed. Um, because basically what we're doing is we're sticking a needle on it. We're doing a, a probably a, a, a core needle biopsy, sticking a needle in, getting a specimen, and then looking at it under, putting it on a, a slide and then looking at it underneath the microscope. And then when we get it there, this is what we're seeing. And this is kind of these, these small, um, you know, we see lots of cells, um, small nuclei. And what that's really pointing us in the direction of is small cell carcinoma. I'll tell you, cause you guys, you know, probably are not familiar with this. Um, and then I should have put a, a picture in this for you guys, but if, if it was squamous cell carcinoma, we often see these little, um, these little uh, bodies in here, which um, are kind of, uh, uh, I forgot the name of them. I'm admittedly blanking on them, but there's little, um, it, it, due to hypercalcemia, we can see kind of these um, little small uh, aspects in the actual um, biopsy. Okay, so um, now, so yes, there is kind of this cancer going on. We've identified that. Um, but what is the bigger thing going on that we need to treat um, during this hospital admission? What are we treating? You guys are close. What's causing the altered mental status, do you think? Yeah, the hyponatremia. I agree with Sammy. I think it is the hyponatremia, which is, is causing this altered mental status. So I agree. 
Um, and that's really what we're going to talk about here. Okay. So how do we treat it? What we're going to do? Um, and we call this, as we kind of alluded to before, um, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Okay. That's uh, the kind of million dollar word for SIADH, okay, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, okay, and this is secondary to small cell lungs, uh, lung cell cancer, so this is a perineoplastic syndrome, so remember back to the first few slides when I said there may be symptom complexes that present this way, if your patient comes in with a free water deficit in combination with other things going on, we maybe want to be thinking of what is causing this. Yes, this patient has SIADH, but what is causing this SIADH, this kind of free water deficit, okay? Yes, we can have psychogenic polydipsia where, you know, someone goes out and they, they chug those big gallons of things and they get a free water deficit, sure. Um, but usually those people are, are peeing out lots of water. Their, their urine um, osmolality is usually, you know, very, very low. Um, and, and, you know, in this regard, um, how are we treating it? We're treating a free water, um, a, a, a free water, basically overload. Okay. So we have too much free water, um, which is diluting out our, um, our actual sodium. Okay. So what do we do if this patient is, is, you know, pretty symptomatic, what we're doing is we're giving 3% saline. Okay. Another thing that we can do is give on um, these drugs called Baptan drugs. Basically they're, um, they're vasopressin, um, antagonists. And, um, really what these, uh, Baptan drugs are doing, um, as we kind of see over in this image on the right is we see when vasopressin kind of binds to the V2 receptor and the V2 receptor is responsible for free water re reabsorption. Okay. The V1 receptor is more in the, um, arterioles and cause constriction. Okay. So when it binds to that receptor, what we see is it's anti-diuretic hormone. Okay. So we're, we're getting not as much diuresis. So you guys tell me what would be an instance where anti-diuretic hormone would be released naturally in the body that we're not talking about SIADH anymore. We're talking about just normal physiological function. So what would be a stimulus for ADH to be released? Yeah, if you're dehydrated, perfect. So if you're, you know, out in the, the desert, um, here's a cactus and you're dehydrated and, you know, you're sitting there and uh, you have, for whatever reason, your friends left you out there. They're bad friends. Um, you haven't drank any water in two days. Um, you can bet that ADH is going to be released in your body. Okay. And what that's going to do is it's telling your body not to diurese, meaning you're not going to pee. If we have, uh, you know, a shortage of water, your body's pretty smart. It says, let's hold back water. Okay, so we're going to hold back water. We're not going to diurese it. So what is happening, and you'll see it kind of down here in this image right here, is antidiuretic hormone kind of binds to this receptor, and it's a G protein coupled mechanism. And, and you don't need to know what that means, truly. But um, what happens is these aquaporins are uh, kind of mobilized. They get put on this membrane, um, which is on, this is the urine, basically. Remember the tubule, we kind of drew that um, picture and then it goes like that. That's the glomerulus. And then it goes down like this and it loops up. There's a collecting duct. Um, we talked about that when we talked about renal stuff, but what's happening here is, um, the aquaporin gets stuck on the membrane, um, of the, um, actual tubule. And as a result, water can be, um, reabsorbed. Okay. And when water is reabsorbed, um, it can correspondingly be reabsorbed to the vasorecta, which is in the blood. Okay. So that's why we're reabsorbing water to go back in the blood, to have, um, a, a sort of, um, increase in the water to balance out that hype, maybe hypernatremia that may be going on because we have a deficit of water. Now in, in SIADH, we have too much water. We're, um, 
unnecessarily secreting ADH and correspondingly reabsorbing too much water and diluting out our sodium, okay? That's what's going on here. And I want you to see the physiological mechanism because if you know what's going on, you don't have to memorize things unnecessarily. You just know what's going on, okay? Then um, the other thing um, that we're gonna uh, kind of talk about here is, is the cancer. And, and we're not probably going to treat this cancer on this admission, um, but in, in terms of, of this cancer for this patient, um, they will get chemotherapy. They're not a surgical candidate, unfortunately, um, because usually by the time small cell carcinoma is um, caught, it's usually pretty far progressed. So they're usually not surgical candidates. They'll get chemo, um, uh, cisplatin, platinum-based um, drugs, and atopicide, which is a DNA um, decoupling um, chemotherapy drug. Other thing they'll get is radiation to the chest. Good. So let's keep going here, and, and we're going to talk about um, what SIADH really is. And we talked about that a little bit already, so it shouldn't be too much to kind of touch on here. But as we kind of talked about, this is really this, um, this inappropriate secretion of ADH, okay? And it, the name tells you exactly what it is, okay? So what's going on is that there's a normal or even increased plasma volume. And that's what we had in our patient. We had an increased plasma volume, which is resulting regardless of that in, in more water being reabsorbed. So we have a, a inappropriate stimulus of ADH and we have this normal amount of, of sodium. And despite that, we're just diluting it out. So imagine, you know, we throw, um, you know, here's our, our cup and we have, um, this is our, our body's um, salt volume. And in, in this, um, you know, in our body, we have, you know, normally um, one, we'll say 137 um, is our sodium. Okay. So 137 and um, despite having a normal sodium, we have this release of ADH. Okay. And the ADH, what it's going to do is it's antidiuretic hormone. Remember those uh, aquaporins are going to be put on the membrane and we're going to keep reabsorbing water. So we're just dumping water Then we get more and we're dumping water. And then we're, we get even more and inappropriate stimulus and we're dumping water, despite the fact that, you know, maybe we have um, a normal pressure, maybe we have, you know, a, a normal plasma volume, but we keep filling up the tank with water. And as a result, that osmolality is going to drop and we're going to have diluted out our, our sodium there. Okay. And when we talk about, you know, mechanism of this happening, remember this is by the vasopressin receptor, that V2 receptor, um, which causes fluid re reabsorption and causes increased blood volume. Okay, so if we know that there's increased blood volume as a result of this, what is another stimulus of this um, that you guys can think of? Why would we want to increase our blood volume? Yes, dehydration, but what else? Perfusion, yes. Blood pressure, good. So Josh got that one, excellent. Um, it is a perfusion problem, Seema, so you're right in that regard. But what we're saying is if the, you know, imagine, imagine, um, you know, you're working in the ED and you're triaging someone who just got stabbed. You know, they're losing lots of blood. You can bet that you're going to release antidiuretic hormone from your pituitary gland in an attempt to kind of reabsorb more fluid to keep the blood volume normal. Okay. That's the, the body's a smart thing. You know, we're going to kind of have these mechanisms. Um, if you remember the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, that's also going to be, uh, you know, active to start to kind of increase the blood, blood volume to increase the pressure. Okay. And what's the etiology of this? It's multifactorial, unfortunately. And we talked about this kind of um, malignant disease category, and we talked about small cell car carcinoma. Okay. But also other things can do it. So pulmonary disorders. So we can see it as a result of infection, lung infections. We can see it in respiratory failure. We can see it in um, different drugs that 
Okay. Often uh, antipsychotic drugs. Um, so things for um, schizophrenia often can, can do it. Um, other things are, we can see hereditary. Um, other things, obviously bleeding can do it. Um, head trauma, brain tumors. That's where we talked about the pituitary adenoma. Um, but there's lots of different things that cause it. Um, and, and this is kind of the one that you may be exposed to. Um, and then in terms of treatment, um, you know, how do we treat this? We talked a little bit about it um, before, but it ultimately depends on the extent of the symptoms. Okay. So if we see somebody of whom has mild symptoms, the, the, you know, they maybe just had nausea um, and, 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 you know, a little bit of um, lethargy, but not anywhere in, in terms of the symptoms that our patient had, what we might do is um, often um, we would do fluid restriction, tell this person, you can't drink any water. Um, and then uh, as a result, what we're going to do is by them not drinking water, um, we're, we're going to have the, an increase in the sodium concentration in the blood. Okay. Now, if somebody has um, advanced symptoms, we might consider using the Vaptan drug, which remember is the anti-vasopressin drug or 3% saline, which is um, hyperosmolar saline. Same thing with grave symptoms. Okay. So the, the patient's having seizures, um, you know, respiratory insufficiency, respiratory distress, we might uh, consider using 3% saline as well. All right. Um, let's keep going here. All right. And now what we're going to talk about is some of these other things that can present as a result of um, perineoplastic syndromes in lung cancer. Okay. So um, obviously there's lots of, you know, things to talk about in terms of, um, you know, what's going on in terms of local tumor growth. That's not this lecture today. Um, in, in terms of um, next week's lecture, we're going to talk about dyspnea. Um, so we're going to talk about shortness of breath and how we really address shortness of breath because um, it's really wide, really broad. It can be from the heart. It can be from the lungs. It can be because of a sodium problem. It could be because of a lot of different things. Um, and, and personally, that's why I like internal medicine. It makes you think a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, what we're really talking about today is these uh, perineoplastic syndromes, obviously. and um, the first thing that we're going to, to really discuss, um, and, and let me clear this so we can go on to the next slide here and talk about our first neopla perineoplastic syndrome, is this idea of increased TGF beta. And we know that that's going to lead to increased extracellular matrix protein. And you probably remember that from biology where, you know, we, if we have increased extracellular matrix um, protein, we're going to get growth of different tissues. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. And this is called clubbing. Um, and you can see it on this gentleman's fingers. Um, and, and we see this kind of wide angle. And when you put the finger kind of like this, you see this, you see it kind of like the nail kind of go up a little bit. So there's the nail, it's a horrible drawing. Um, and, and you kind of see it like that where the nail kind of goes up and this can be indicative of yes, cancer, but also kind of, it can be indicative of lung problems in, in general. All right. So that's the first one, fairly simple here. And then the next one that we want to talk about is this idea of um, increased parathyroid related peptide. Okay. That's anti um, PTHRP. Okay, that's what that means right here. So if we have an increase in that, um, first we'll kind of talk about you know the normal the normal uh, function of parathyroid related hormone, and what that is is these parathyroid related or this parathyroid hormone PTH is going to bind to its own receptor. So that's what this is, and as a result, um, rank L uh, rank ligand gets activated, and what we're going to see is resorption due to osteoclasts and release of calcium into the, the, the bloodstream. And similarly, parathyroid hor hormone also acts on the kidney to increase uh, calcium reabsorption and also in the gut to increase calcium re reabsorption. So it's not just um, in the bone, we see it in the bone, but we also see it in other places as well. Okay, but what we're talking about today is this um, PTHRP. 
Okay. And in with the PTHRP, it does the same thing. It, it's re a related peptide, but it binds the hormone. And what I want you to remember here, and everybody's going to try to trick you from now until forever, is that in cancer, when we see an increase um, in parathyroid related peptide, so we see that as a result of the cancer. Okay. Remember, that we're going to get this pathway. We're going to see rank L, rank ligand kind of act on osteoclasts, which increased calcium. But what's going to happen is that we're going to get negative feedback to the normal pathway to PTH. And what that's going to happen or what's going to happen is there's going to be a decrease in PTH, but we're still getting the stimulus of this, this abnormal hormone. So we're still getting hypercalcemia. Okay. And that's what I want you to remember. And I'm almost hundred percent certain I wrote a question about that in the quiz. So don't get that wrong. Okay. There's parathyroid related or parathyroid related peptide, and that's increased. And because of that pathway, it feeds back and you get a decrease of the regular parathyroid, um, the parathyroid hormone. Okay. Good. So that's the next one. That's the, the PTHRP. And that's because of, um, usually squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Um, and, and we get that hypercalcemia. All right. So let's go on to the next one here. All right. Now here's the Cushing syndrome that we kind of talked about. And, and with this, um, the, the cancer kind of causes an increased um, release of ACTH, um, adrenocortical, um, adrenocorticotropin hormone, ACTH. Okay. And as a result, what we see is, okay, um, we get um, a, a, a stimulus. So in this instance, it's because of the cancer, we get a, a stimulus, we get a corticotropin um, releasing hormone, or I'm sorry, uh, CRH, um, which is corticotropin releasing hormone. Okay. That causes a release of ACTH. Um, usually in cancer, we get the stimulus of ACTH and it doesn't really happen through this pathway, but I want to show you it. Um, you get ACTH, which correspondingly, usually this is coming from the cancer. So the cancer is causing an increased release in ACTH, which acts on the adrenal gland, which is kind of those hats above the kidney. kidney. So you probably recognize the kidney. They look like kidney beans. Um, the the um, adrenal hormones sit right on top. And because of this ACTH release, we get an increased stimulus, an increased release in cortisol. And as a result, that stress hormone causes a few things. It causes um, that moon face, a round face. It causes the easy bruising, the easy bleeding. You see that kind of thick skin. You see increased um, blood pressure. You see an increase in, um, in, in blood sugar. Um, so we know that if we give a diabetic um, steroids because of, of anything, if they're sick, if they you know, need them for another reason, we see hyperglycemia. Okay. But the main thing that we see is kind of this, um, this round belly. We see these purple striae, they can be purple red. We see them on the abdomen. Um, also kind of this Buffalo hump. So this kind of hump here. Um, but those are the main sign, signs that we see, um, other than the fact that we see a large abdomen and kind of skin, skinny legs, basically. Okay. But, um, that's the, the, um, the, Cushing syndrome. And then what are they going to present like, you know, they may have hyperglycemia, they may have these physical symptoms, but they may come to you. And just over time, what they say is, you know, I feel weak, I feel nauseous, I've been vomiting. Um, and then they may come in with kind of hypokalemia, hyperglycemia, and a high blood pressure. And that might point you into the direction to kind of work it up in terms of, um, you know, Cushing syndrome. Okay. Now we have one more to kind of talk about that. I promise you we would talk about. Um, and that is this Lambert Eaton syndrome. That is the result of, um, usually small cell carcinoma. Um, but what's happening here, um, is antibodies are kind of, um, are, so this is, this is a nerve cell. Let's kind of break it down. I, I won't jump right in. So here is the nerve. That's what this yellow thing is right here. Okay, and, and this is the um, this is the postsynaptic um, nerve on this side. So we call this presynaptic, and you might remember this from from chemistry or biology or anything like this. So here's presynaptic, here's postsynaptic, 
And we know that these, um, these nerves kind of abut each other and in, in order to release um, these uh, these vesicles of which have neurotransmitters. So that's what's happening. You get an action potential on um, the action, action potential. It kind of travels down. Um, you get a, a surge of calcium, which causes the release of, um, uh, acetylcholine, which is right here. And the acetylcholine is going to, to act on these, uh, the, these postsynaptic receptors in order to, um, cause the muscles to contract. Okay. Those are, these are things that are important for this whole kind of, um, action. And, and, you know, what it's showing here is skeletal muscle on the postsynaptic side. So basically breaking all that down is if we have an antibody of, which is inhibiting the release of calcium here, what we see is that if calcium can't come in, we can't get that action potential. We can't have the release of acetylcholine, which means we get no muscle firing, okay? And that's where we get that weakness, okay? So we see weakness um, that um, improves with repeated use. And that's the main thing because if we get increased uh, use um, over time, we get more synapses, we get more action potentials. What we see is this nerve is getting inundated with signals. And as a result, we do get some calcium that comes through and then we correspondingly get that re release of acetylcholine, which acts on the postsynaptic membrane, which can cause that muscle contraction. And then when we compare this with um, the kind of opposite of that, um, that is myasthenia gravis. And you may have heard of that. It's kind of a, a weakness. And what that is, is um, antibodies to the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. Okay. And that causes um, weakness that is worse with use. And that's how we kind of compare these two things. So if we see weakness in a, in a smoker um, of, of whom um, it gets better with use, um, then we would want to think, you know, maybe Lambert Eaton. So if we do a nerve conduction study on this, okay, here's kind of, um, here's the stimuli, um, here's stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. We might, and, and this is time here on the X axis, we might see that the nerve conduction gets better with time, okay? So here's it getting better. And then if we compare that to, these are horrible drawings, I'm sorry. Um, and if we compare that to myasthenia gravis, um, which is, I'm going to write down here, we might see that, you know, maybe it, it goes kind of like this, where over time it gets a little bit worse because of those antibodies on the postsynaptic membrane. Okay. And um, the, the main thing I want you to kind of take away from this is, yes, it's this weakness, but it's associated with malignancy often. Okay. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. So um, let's see. Let's see if I'm right. I'm usually wrong. I am wrong. Um, okay. So the the only thing that I, I want to say about this is there are a few that kind of, and, and this is the same exact slide that we talked about before. So this is, um, uh, could this happen with any neurotransmitter or just acetylcholine? It's usually with acetylcholine because um, it, 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 you know, it could affect other things. I assume this might be a better question for um, a neurologist, um, but um, you know, it, it usually kind of Lambert eaten by definition is those acetylcholine, um, because of the lack of calcium. And when we talk about synapses and we talk about action potentials, yes, it affects the, um, you know, or the calcium kind of causes the action potential, um, and, and the release of those, um, those vesicles. Um, but Lambert eaten by definition is acetylcholine. All right. Um, so what I want you to remember and what we really talked about today was the small cell carcinoma. So, um, and, and you'll often see lung cancer differentiated by small cell versus non-small cell. But remember, um, and, and the way I always learned it in school was um, uh, small cell carcinoma is often associated with the A's. So um, SIADH, um, and then we also see Cushing syndrome, which is um, a C um, A C T H. Um, then it obviously is associated with Lambert Eden. We just talked about that. Um, but you know, those are the main ones that I want you to kind of, you know, um, think about to reason through. And then when we talk about um, hypercalcemia, we want to think about um, 
squamous cell carcinoma as well. Um, and, and that, you know, is what we're really going to see um, w w with these different things. So think about, you know, hypercalcemia You in, in lung pathology, you want to think squamous cell carcinoma. Hypercalcemia in general, you want to kind of be cognizant of, um, you know, if you see hypercalcemia, you want to think malignancy, but it's not always that, you know, you could have um, hyperparathyroidism or, or anything along those lines that's causing an increased um, stimulation and increased release of calcium from the bone. All right. So this is my last slide. I know that for a fact because it's my summary slide. But before we kind of um, wrap up, um, let me um, launch the poll um, so that you guys can kind of gauge where you're at now, um, being, you know, an hour into the talk. All right, I think most of you guys are in there. Um, so a, a, a lot of you guys, none of you guys said you knew none, which is uh, is great. Um, a few of you guys said you know a little, a lot of you guys said you know some, 80% of you, which is great. Um, and that's really where I want you guys to be right now. You know, you don't need to be experts on this um, and, and you just have to kind of have an idea of what these things are. And I hope that it was kind of broken down in a way that you guys can understand. I know this stuff can be overwhelming and, and you know, um, you can be inundated with information, um, but um, that's it for me. Um, I'll stick around if you guys have any questions at all about, you know, medical school, about the, the talk today. Um, otherwise, I will see you guys in um, next week. I'm teaching like three in a row. Um, I'm teaching, obviously, today I'm teaching about uh, shortness of breath next week. And then the week after, I'm teaching um, a little bit of cardiology in terms of atrial fibrillation. So um, we'll have a, a good kind of um, few medicine talks. Um, and then I, I think you guys are talking about, I don't remember. I'm not even going to lie to you and, and try to think of it. Um, but it's not me afterwards. You'll get, a, you'll get a new face. You're stuck with me for three weeks, and then you'll get somebody new after that. Um, but I'll stick around for a little while if you guys have questions, anything you want to ask. Um, and um, otherwise, have a good night. Thank you all for coming. Um, I always love doing this. Um, but yeah, I'll stick around if you guys have any questions for me. So there is one question so far, which is, um, how do you know when to order a CT versus an X-ray? That's a good question because often what we'll what we'll do is to order, you know, an X-ray first. Um, if an X-ray kind of shows a lung mass, or is you know we're um, you know concerned about a, a lung pathology that can't be discerned from an X-ray, then we might order a CT. Um, if we see something on an x-ray and want to get, um, you know, further imaging in terms of a CT to see more uh, higher resolution film, then we'll get a CT. Um, the way that I wrote this case up, it, it wouldn't really help you to, to kind of discern um, CT versus x-ray. Uh, initially, you might, you know, when you're, when you're working this patient up for altered mental status, you might order a few tests. You might get a... Um, and an x-ray first, but this patient already had a, a, um, a, a chest CT. 
So in, in this regard, you might go straight to the CT or try to get those films or whatever. But, you know, if this patient had no history, you might say, okay, let's work this patient up with an EKG. Let's get some labs. Um, let's do a head CT and a chest x-ray. And on that chest x-ray, you may see that mass. And in order to um, discern exactly where this mass is in terms of the, the cardiac um, or, or the um, in the actual thorax, you might get a CT after that. So it's just additional workup. If you got, you know, a chest x-ray and it was completely normal, there would be no reason to get a CT, okay? I hope that answers your, your question a little bit more. Um, next question was, how do you add these virtual rounds into your applications? That's a, a great question as well. Um, I, I don't think there's any confirmation um, yet that um, these virtual rounds can be added to your, your applications in, in terms of them being acknowledged as actual like shadowing hours. Um, and, and, and that's fine. I think that it's totally appropriate to add these to your, your applications, even if they don't count them as shadowing hours because it's still an activity where, you know, whether you do it with us or somebody else or, you know, whatever, it's still an activity where you're, you're participating and you're exposed to medicine. Um, and, you know, that was the whole premise behind creating, you know, virtual rounds is that, um, you know, you're exposed to medicine during the pandemic when, you know, volunteer experiences, um, shadowing experiences are kind of limited. OK, so, uh, you know, you can always add them to your activities. I think that that's appropriate. You can talk about them in your secondary essays, um, anything along those lines. You could talk about them in your interviews, all of those things. Um, if you add them to your um, actual activities, you want to kind of have a, a number of the hours. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, when you get the certificate of completion, you know, then you get you can kind of track them all and include them in your application. But I, I think you certainly can and you should because it shows your dedication to, to learning and, and you know, getting um, sort of this opportunity to be immersed in medicine. And I think Josh, you had a question too, is that right? I was just sending a direct chat to you, so. <laughs> If you guys have any other questions, you can certainly ask them as well. So in terms of rotations, um, for your fourth year, it is normal to do them away from your school and you can definitely do that. Um, for instance, you know, if you end up going to school in, um, you know, New Mexico, like me, um, I chose to do all of my fourth year rotations um, away. So I, I didn't do a single rotation in New Mexico whatsoever. Um, albeit I did do my core rotations in El Paso, Texas, which is about an hour from my school. Um, and then my fourth year, um, in order to be closer to my spouse, I um, did all of my rotations away. So I'm in Pensacola, Florida, um, where I've done my whole year, and then I'll go back for, you know, graduation in a couple weeks. Um, but you have the opportunity to do that. And fourth year, usually, um, what you do is you kind of, um, you know, depending on your specialty that you want to do, um, some, you know, are, are more, um, you know, more common than others to do away rotations, um, to do sub internships, they're called sub eyes or um, audition rotations, which are exactly what they sound like. You kind of go, um, you know, show what you know, um, show that you would be a good fit for their program, um, et cetera. For instance, if you wanted to go to um, Emory or something, you wanna do um, orthopedic surgery at Emory, you might apply and do a sub-internship or an audition rotation in surgery at that institution to say, hey, look, I'm interested, um, kind of show that you're a good fit, show that, you know, you, you get along with people and you're kind and all those things, um, which I know it sounds nerve wracking. 
Um, and, and, you know, as a result, they're more likely if they like you to, um, give you an, an invitation to interview with them when you actually apply to residency. That's the whole premise. Um, some people fourth year go all over the place. Um, and, and you know, I did a, a rotation in, in Jacksonville, um, but I did most of my other rotations, um, here in Pensacola, or I did one in Alabama, um, but depending on your school, you have the opp opportunity to do that. With my school, I did. I know some people can only do, or some schools have like a, a limit on it where you can only do so many away rotations and then you have to do the rest at your home institution. Um, but usually for fourth year, you have that opportunity to um, go ahead and apply um, it, or go ahead and apply for auditions and um, sub eyes where, where you kind of go and, and show um, you know, who you are, show your face. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay. And then the next question was, um, what is the difference between CT and MRI? Which one shows more? So it depends on what you're looking at. Um, if you, um, are looking, if you want to look at kind of blood vessels in multiple phases and you want to see the posterior circulation of the brain, um, you might use an MRI. Um, if you're looking at, um, you know, um, vessels in the, the chest or the heart, you might use a CT angiogram where you're kind of using contrast to look at the vessels. Um, so it just depends on what you're looking at specifically. Um, MRI kind of is, can be used in um, orthopedics, um, sometimes in, in neurology. Um, but in terms of um, the thorax, usually what we see is um, CT, CT angiogram. You guys are very welcome. I'll see you guys next week.